you very much. Thanks, Arthur, for the introduction. This is C Star. It's joint work with my colleagues from ETH Zurich, Benjamin, Roger, and Martin. So to start, remember that on public blockchain, smart contracts interact with data which is stored in clear text on the blockchain, which is accessible to everyone. So if you want to store sensitive information, such as your medical data, this is, of course, a problem, right? And ideally, you would have something like this, where the data is hidden, and you can now interact with your data as before using your smart contracts. And note that this concept of data privacy does not protect the smart contract itself, but only the data which is stored. This is not a new idea. Several works have tried to achieve data privacy, but they have various limitations. Some of the early works, they bring privacy to payments mostly, but they do not focus on general smart contracts. Some works rely on trusted managers or hardware to enable data privacy, but if you do not want to trust these hardware managers, this is, of course, a problem. More recently, there have been works which rely on cryptographic primitives to enable data privacy, but uh, it turns out that in practice, if you want to use these tools to implement new applications, you actually need to manually uh, integrate these cryptographic primitives, which can be quite challenging. In our previous work, CK, we have tried to mitigate the problems I just mentioned, but CK has an expressivity problem and you're restricted to some basic uh, smart contracts. Here I am presenting CSTAR. CSTAR is a system for data privacy on more general smart contracts, and it does not require you to trust any trusted manager or hardware. And importantly, you do not need cryptographic expertise to implement private smart contracts using CSTAR. Uh, CSR is highly expressive, and as a practical benefit, you can actually execute the contracts on Ethereum, which is very nice. Conceptually, CSR extends our previous CK work by homomorphic encryption in order to give you more expressivity. We will see this in a second. So what's the high-level idea of what we're doing here? Consider this example where we store balances of users on the blockchain, like here Alice's and Bob's balance. And in order to keep these balances private, we encrypt it under the public keys of their owner. So Alice's balance will be encrypted under Alice's public key. And now suppose Alice wants to send one of her tokens over to Bob. And to do so, she of course wants to decrease her balance by one and in contrast, increase Bob's balance by one. And now of course everything is encrypted, so how can you do this? Uh, the following idea is not new, like other work has done this manually, and the idea is to use non-interactive zero-knowledge proofs and homomorphic encryption to actually enable this transaction. So let's distinguish the two cases here. First, let's talk about the al uh, values owned by Alice, which is the case self-owned here. And in order for Alice to decrease her balance, it's, it's very easy, right? She will decrypt her previous balance, apply the desired plaintext operation, and then encrypt it again to get the new ciphertext. And now, of course, to make sure that Alice does not cheat, because she could essentially apply any operation, right, and send a new ciphertext, she will attach a non-interactive zero-knowledge proof which states that this plaintext operation has been applied correctly. In case of Bob's value, which is what we call uh, foreign data here, Alice can rely on the homomorphic property of the encryption scheme. So if your encryption scheme is additively homomorphic, Alice can first encrypt the constant one and then homomorphically integrate this increment by one inside the Bob ciphertext to get a new ciphertext. And now Alice will just send the new ciphertext and the non-interactive zero knowledge proof to the blockchain for verification. And as I said, the previous work has done this, specifically this application here I've shown you with the balances. Our goal here is to automate this whole process for more general smart contracts. And there are various questions popping up here. For instance, how do you even distinguish between cell phone and foreign data? A priori, it's not clear what this even means. What about the interactions between these two cases? And also, if your encryption scheme is only partially homomorphic, there are some restrictions, of course, in what you can express on the foreign data here. So we need to account for that as well. And finally, uh, we need to talk about what exactly we need to prove in this zero knowledge proof and how do we make this efficient? Because we will need to reason about evaluating cryptographic primitives as part of the zero knowledge proof. So CSAR is a system uh, which actually helps you to bring data privacy to your smart contracts using the previous idea. And in CSTAR, developers implement the application in the custom CSTAR programming language. It's very similar to Solidity as it implements the logic, 
but it also contains privacy annotations indicating what should be kept private. We will see this in a second. And then you feed this through the CSTAR compiler, which will automatically introduce additively homomorphic encryption and CK snarks in order to certify correctness and get data privacy. And the resulting Solidity contract can be executed on Ethereum. So let's have a look at the input contract. And the CSTAR programming language is based on privacy types. The privacy types help you to distinguish the foreign and self-owned data case and to reflect the restrictions of the homomorphic encryption scheme. So here I've implemented the example we had previously in plain solidity. So we just have a balance mapping which stores for every address the balance owned by this address. And then I have a transfer function which allows some sender address, which is written as me here, to transfer some value to some recipient address. And as you can see here, we first check whether the sender has sufficient funds, and then we just update the balance mapping as expected, like nothing special here. And now we would like to express the fact that the balances should be kept private. And to this end, CSTAR relies on an idea we introduced previously in our work CK. The idea is to extend data types by privacy types using this no annotation of the form at owner where owner is some address expression indicating the party allowed to see the data. So let's see this on our concrete example. Like if you want to express that the balance is private to the respective party, you need to add these blue privacy annotations. In particular, in this line here, we use this syntax to encode the fact that the balance of Alice is owned by Alice, meaning that it will be encrypted under her public key at runtime. Here in the transfer function, we annotate the value as at me, meaning that it will be self-owned by the transaction sender and hidden to everyone else. The recipient address is just kept public here by not annotating it at all. And now we can just work as usual in the smart contract, so decreasing the balance of the sender is very easy. You just write it the same way as it was before. To increase the balance of the recipient, you actually need to add this reveal expression here. This reveal expression changes the privacy type of the value which previously was self-owned to the recipient. This is required because you want to prevent implicitly leaking information. If you would not write this, like you, you will actually leak the value to the recipient and to make sure that the developer really wants to do this, the developer needs to add this expression here. And as a result here, this addition actually works on two expressions which are not owned by the sender but by some other party. And this is allowed in CSTAR and we will actually use the homomorphic property of the encryption schemes. And note that in uh, the CK work this would actually not work. The nice thing about this privacy type system is that we can reflect the constraints of the homomorphic encryption scheme. So for instance, if Alice was to write the code I've shown here where she tries to add a value owned by Bob, to a value owned by Charlie, you would get a type error. Because these like two elements will be encrypted on the different public keys and there's no way Alice could actually combine this at runtime. So that's very nice. Finally here for this requirement statement, Alice needs to reveal the fact that the sender has sufficient funds. Because the fact that the requirement sta statement will actually work out will leak that this is true, so you actually need to reveal this explicitly again using this expression. So this is the resulting contract. The nice thing is that developers do not need any cryptographic expertise to implement this. They just need to understand the privacy type system, essentially. So let's see how we can automatically compile this input contract to an output contract on Ethereum. And we will see how we deal with interactions and what exactly we need to prove in the zero knowledge proof. I have the example from before here, the transfer function. And the idea is to compile this to a Solidity contract by following the privacy types we have just seen. Remember that whenever some expression is private to some party according to the type system in the input, it will be encrypted under this party's public key in the output contract. And now the compiler just checks the input contract for private expressions. For instance, consider on the left hand side the updated balance of the sender, which is just the evaluation of this subtraction. This will be replaced by a ciphertext argument, new me, which will hold the encrypted new balance at runtime, just like in the example we have seen at the beginning of the talk. And this ciphertext will be computed by the sender actually beforehand, before sending it to the blockchain, of course. 
And now we need to make sure that this ciphertext has been computed correctly. To do so, we collect a set of constraints which will be used in the zero knowledge proof. So what this constraint says here is quite easy actually. So the idea is that when you decrypt the previous balance using your secret key, and then from it subtract the plain text value, and then from the result, like encrypt it again, then you get this new me ciphertext. It's quite obvious here. And note that of course all the secrets here, for instance the secret key of the sender, are of course used as witnesses in the zero knowledge proof. So they will not be seen on the blockchain, but they will be hidden. Similarly, uh, CSTAR replaces the new balance of the recipient by this new true argument. And to compute this, the sender will actually apply this homomorphic addition operation we've seen previously, and will also prove that this computation has been performed correctly as part of the zero knowledge proof here using this additional constraint. Note that while we could in theory apply this homomorphic addition not inside the proof circuit, but on the solidity contract, we do not do it in order to uh, save gas costs essentially because it saves us an operation in the output. And then last but not least, also publicly revealed expressions will be replaced, but this time by plain text uh, arguments working the same way. And then we add an according constraint. Should be rather uh, clear in this example, I guess. And then all you, got, all you got to do is just add a verification statement which checks a zero knowledge proof containing the constraints we have just collected here. And this will actually ensure that you updated your ciphertext correctly. And note that this is all automated, right? So you have nothing to do if you want to implement these contracts. So note that even though we are relying on an additively homomorphic encryption scheme, we can also support multiplications in particular, we can support multiplications of foreign values by a self-owned uh, value or a public value. You can have a look at our paper if you want to find out how this exactly works. And of course, there are many more details. I, I just shown you a pretty basic example. It's, it's very interesting to, to get a practical system to work, so have a look at it if you're uh, interested. Uh, the system here has two important guarantees which we formalize and prove in the paper. The first guarantee is correctness meaning that you cannot actually violate the logic you specified in the input contract. And the second property is privacy, meaning that an active attacker cannot learn more in the real world than it can learn which was allowed from the privacy annotations in an ideal world. That's kind of the idea. So we implemented the system and evaluated its uh, efficiency. You can find the source code of this on our uh, GitHub repository, CK, here. Uh, achieving efficiency was quite tricky, actually. Using a naive implementation here, using straightforward building blocks, actually led to an explosion of runtime, like it was not usable at all. So we ended up uh, with the following. So we use Grof16 CK snarks, which were very efficient, and exponential Elgamal encryptions over elliptic curves, which uh, gives you an additively homomorphic encryption scheme. And in order for this uh, Elgamal encryption operation to be efficiently provable as part of the zero knowledge proof, we had to rely on elliptic curve embedding, which is just some cryptographic technique which has been used already previously. As a technicality here, exponential Elgamal encryption requires you to solve a discrete logarithm upon decryption. So if you want decryption to be feasible within a few seconds, you actually need to restrict plain text to around uh, 32 bits. We did this in the implementation and already reflect this in the, in the type system, which will give you a type error if you try to use a non-32-bit uh, integer with this uh, system here. Uh, we implement the 12 example contracts using our system, and these contracts include a re-implementation of a previous uh, private payment system, CEther. This system has been manually designed uh, to give you kind of a private wallet, which is an extension of what we've seen previously here. And the offers like instantiated this idea by hand and in contrast you can just implement this using the privacy annotations and compile it to something equivalent. So this is very nice. Uh, on a commodity desktop machine you get reasonable transaction generation times like at most one minute here. And this time is uh, dominated by proof generation time because generating the zero knowledge proof is like the most heavy task here. In terms of gas costs, this is the cost you need to pay when you actually execute the resulting contract on Ethereum. This is around 340k gas. It's in line to existing applications such as Uniswap. 
If you want to know how much this is in terms of dollars, I, I did this two weeks ago when I made the presentation. It was around $32, which is quite high. The problem with these numbers is that it's super volatile, like Ethereum price and gas prices, they tend to spike a lot. So it's not very useful to, to talk about monetary costs here, but still I put it for completeness. So with that, I'd like to conclude. I have presented C-Star, allowing you to express private smart contracts easily and automatically compiling them to contracts for Solidity. Thank you very much. Thank you, Samuel. Wonderful presentation. Um, any questions from the audience? Hello, yeah, nice presentation. I'm Saura from UIC. So you said you use Growth 16 ZK snarks, and they have this circuit based uh, trusted setups. Like for each circuit, you have to do a different circuit. So, a uh, different setup. So, how do you like, how does this work right now? Great question. So, as you say correctly, the scheme we use requires you to do one trusted setup per circuit, and this compilation process produces one circuit per function. So, you actually, if you want to deploy your contract, you need to perform this trusted setup phase yourself. This is like out of of, of context of our tool, but you actually get a separate circuit and a separate setup per function, that's true. I see, and uh, generic question, like what are the next steps, like uh, adopting like, fully homomorphic encryption, or currently you only support additive, right? Uh, <laughs> yeah, so a fully homomorphic encryption is very inefficient, so it's, it's very hard to use in, in this blockchain uh, context, and also you, you would need to reason about fully homomorphic encryption as part of zero knowledge proof, which I find is quite tricky. What you can do is integrate other encryption schemes like multipl multiplicatively homomorphic encryption, but we, we just uh, determined that this is not very useful uh, for example applications, but of course you could try to do this. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Do we have time? Or? Uh, yeah, go ahead. Yep. Hi, uh, thank you very much for the presentation. It's really great that you have this very ordinary user from the scheme. Uh, my question is going to be about this Zether implementation that you did. I think they had much higher gas costs in their original paper. I think maybe about like seven million or something. Yes. Is it because you are using growth 16 that you gain from that? Or? So the, this is a longer discussion. So one problem is that they use a different version of Ethereum, which used to have a bit different gas costs for these cryptographic operations. Like, uh, unfortunately, we could not compare to their implementation because it was neither open source nor available, even though we asked the offers. Even so, they use the bulletproof system, which is much more expensive than Groth 16 to verify. So I think this is the reason why they, even in a newer uh, version of Ethereum, would get higher gas costs than what we have. Uh -huh. So you are kind of trading off like trusted setup with efficiency. Exactly. And of course, in theory, you could just use our system with the bulletproof proofer. Then mm -hmm. you would likely get higher costs, but you would get rid of the trusted setup assumption. I see. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Ian. Yeah. Uh, Ian Myers, University of Maryland. Uh, what's the privacy model here? A lot of these attempts to do zero knowledge for account models either end up where you leak uh, access patterns or you have to lock every account to do a single transaction. Yes, so in this uh, work here, you leak the access patterns. So the access memory locations will be published. In okay. particular, in this transaction I've shown here, the transfer function, you can see it on the screen, it is leaked which parties uh, access the balance in this mapping, yes. Okay, so you're just hiding the values but not the identities. Okay. Exactly, yeah. Thank you. Excellent. Um, yep, I think then time is up, so okay. thank you very much. Yeah.